Good evening. Today is the 15th day of November 2015, and we continue with our explorations in Savitri, coming close to finishing now the first book. We are on Book 1, Canto 5. And as always, I begin with a few lines from Mother's Talks about Savitri. And this one, these two sentences, <clears throat> for me, sum up everything. He has crammed the whole universe in a single book. It is a marvelous work, magnificent and of an incomparable perfection. You know, before writing, before writing Savitri, Sri Aurobindo said to me, I am impelled to launch on a new adventure. I was hesitant in the beginning, but now I decided. Still, I do not know how far I shall succeed. I pray for help. And you know what it was? It was, before beginning, I warn you in advance, it was his way of speaking, so full of humility and divine modesty. He never asserted himself. On the day he actually began it, he told me, I have launched myself in a rudderless boat upon the vastness of the infinite. And once having started, he wrote page after page without intermission, as though it were a thing already <coughs> complete up there, and he had only to transcribe it in ink down here on these pages. And so tonight, with our beloved Alok, we continue. Some of these moods and moments of the Divine Incarnate which are described seemingly passingly uh, in the Mother's conversations are amazingly beautiful. Like the Incarnate Divine praying to His Shakti for help. Yeah. It's a wonderful moment. Yes. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know... Such things you don't find, just passing phrase, casually she has mentioned. But what it would imply, I mean, there are instances of the divine praying for help in Indian thought. Rama praying to Durga, invoking her for his crusade against Ravana. So it's, uh, it, it implies within it a world of things that though he is all capable, all knowing, yet they are both in a certain play, have assumed a certain poise. At one point of time when Dilip Kumar Roy asked uh, the mother that you and Sri are very good friends. And the mother replied, mother became a little serious and then she replied, you know, he calls me mother. It, it was a world of you. Oh. When you enter into the manifestation, then there is nothing else but she alone <laughs> who can, the whole range of prakriti, all phenomena from the most mundane and material to the highest are under her charge. And yes, beyond is the Purusha, the unmanifest, who is beyond. But in the circle of manifestation, it is she who alone can really give us whatever is needed for the progress. I remember once that... The Nilima wrote this little book. Yes. And in it she told me that the first glance Sri Aurobindo had of mother, he said three words, you are she. Yes. The mother speaks of this also. Yes. yes. So we had paused at this uh, marvelous line with the finality of an ultimate phrase. These ultimate phrases abound even in Sherbindo's writings. Invariably, if we see Sherbindo's writings, 
very often a chapter or a canto will begin as if summarizing what has transpired. Mm. And again at the end, it will be a very beautiful summary yes. of what yes. has transpired. Yes. So it's something yes. very interesting. Yes. And now we continue with the grammar of the infinite. <laughs> Only infinite can have these rules and go beyond rules. United where times create a mood and tense. So this is a new kind of English, you know, to the style and syntax of identity. So the whole formation, you know, normally meaning which must take the form of sentences. Sentences is the most outward expression. If we go behind the sentence, there is a thought. If we go behind the thought, there is an idea. If we go behind the idea, there is the joy of identity. And through several layers it comes and eventually takes the form of human speech where we have certain rules. But these rules are based on a kind of convention. But there is a greater... Um, there is a greater, uh, you know, unity. There is another kind of grammar which he reveals. United where times creative mood and tense to the style and syntax of identity. Incidentally, in, in Indian thought, we have this birth of grammar. So, the birth of grammar is from Shiva. And how it starts is with his Damru. Now, the interesting part about this Damru is that, you know, if you hear those sounds, there are 14 sounds, somebody may probably remember, uh, the 14 seed sounds in Sanskrit, which originate from the Damru, and out of that, the whole grammar emerges. Now, 14 sounds which are apparently meaningless to a casual hearer, they are random sounds, and out of these sounds, a whole logic, logical train of sounds and words and their combinations emerge. So, uh, Shubindu is revealing to us how the rules of speech emerge. But in their origin, they are born in a state of freedom. And then they slowly come down and outward towards the human speech. A peans swelled from the lost musing deeps. An anthem peeled to the triune ecstasies. So this triune ecstasy is the triple poise of the one divine, individual, cosmic or universal and the transcendent. And there is an anthem which is rising. This is the original music rising from the depths of the abysses and climbing toward. This is the first original psalm ved if one wants to. Yes. This is the song which is there in matter aspiring towards the divine. A pain, pain swell, swell, an anthem peal, yes. a cry. And then he says the strophes yes. of an ode yes. and harmonies, all music. A cry of the moments to the immortal's bliss. Everything in nature cries for that. And uh, this longing in nature which takes the form of suffering... Because eventually all suffering at its bottom is the suffering because of the separation. Or the sense of separation. Because one can never really separate. <laughs> but <laughs> at one place mother says, human beings have tried very hard to separate themselves from the divine. And then with her characteristic sense of humor she says, and they have succeeded. <laughs> they really believe that they are separate. <laughs> and... <laughs> And because of this separateness, there is a suffering, sense of separateness. This suffering then changes into longing, longing for this or that, which may once again bring the desired union. This longing at a still higher level changes into aspiration and a yearning. Yes. And this aspiration and yearning eventually ends in the triune ecstasy. So this is what is being dis I mean, revealed to us so beautifully and... You see, this whole creation can be seen as a cosmic poem and our own life as a poetry with many notes. You know, there is this um, concept of nine rasas or ten rasas in Indian thought. And each rasa mood is, is in itself something uh, very powerful. It's a kind of delight. 
but we we see only one small fraction this is our big problem our life we see a small fraction a small period of time through which we are passing but if we could see the whole range then we would say ah what a beautiful poetry and the music so sometimes even in music there are high notes there is the beat of the trumpets there is the laughter of shiva and all these come together and create the music of the lord and that one passage where he hears the tinkling of the carol yes yes the world soul yes cricket sounds and tinkling yes. of the caravan and the flute and the flute as if these strophes of a cosmic ode a hierarchy of climbing harmonies it's amazing everything is so revealing so these harmonies there are layers and layers there are levels and levels of harmony and uh, it's a whole world being disclosed to us at one place the mother says she speaks about the doctors and the medical atmosphere and she says it's not good it is very conducive to making people sick rather than heal them so the disciple says but mother she is talking about a person x that oh she has gone there mm-hmm. but i don't like hospitals mother says that you know i don't like hospital but she has chosen to go there so the disciple says but mother she is doing well and mother replies yes because she is very much in harmony with that atmosphere so you know at every layer there is a kind of harmony and you are happy in that but this harmony breaks when you have to go to the next layer and next layer so there is an ascending harmony so we have the cliche ignorance is bliss ignorance is bliss <laughs> so as we go further and further newer and newer harmonies are revealed to us it's a climbing harmonies it's not something static not something fixed for all times people with voices and with visages aspired in a crescendo of the gods crescendo of the gods they have plunged into matter and they are moving towards that and this is how these harmonies are this crescendo crescendo you know because in an orchestra mm-hmm. this crescendo is the yes the point yes of the most powerful climactic point yes and starts with the strophes yeah <laughs> and then it builds ah. towards a crescendo so we have to you know also yeah. uh, that's why at one place mother says wait to see the last act in the drama of god it is not yet over so all our conclusions based on just one scene or even half a scene or less than that yes. of a brief life and we draw conclusions about the whole creation life is a meaningless tale told by an idiot well ah. if i see a small uh, half a sentence of a huge book i would feel the same thing but when there is a cosmic vision and a cosmic sentiment then we see ah what a beautiful poem this is from matter's abysses to the spirit speaks above where the immortals changeless seats white chambers of dalliance with eternity casual meetings dalliance what a word dally another place he uses the word loiters yes <laughs> so beautiful these words are we think of you know very seriously one is in front of god and you know kneels and says how can you have Here. dalliance <laughs> <laughs> dalliance with eternity <laughs> but that's what she taught here all these children now they say at that point we could never imagine the mother would call us into her room and we would play ringa ringa roses with her can we imagine yeah. Yeah. mother playing ringa ringa roses with the children <laughs> dalliance with eternity and the stupendous gates of the alone across the unfolding of the seas of self appeared the deathless countries of the one so we see once again the uh, the supramental border on which ashapati stands this yes. is uh, several places indicated in this canto yes. Yes. so this one place again 
the deathless countries of the, of the one are the worlds which are beyond the supramental and beyond so they are based on oneness so we have sat lok chit lok tapas lok anand lok yes. and of course vigyan mein lok these are all countries of the deathless one there is no death no grief and there is the sense of the one and oneness in all beings who are there and no duality no duality and that's why it's the sphere of immortality but here below is the country of death the home of death and this is the big challenge so ashapati witnesses appeared the deathless countries of the one a many miracled consciousness unrolled so this again the supramental borders where the one throws himself out into millions and millions of rays and countless words each is a miracle in its own right a wonder vast aim and process and unfettered norms <laughs> what what unfettered we were talking norm. about oxymoron <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yes yes <laughs> there is either a norm or there is <laughs> unfettered free, free without any chains and yet it is a norm assumed a certain poise assumed by nature it's like when you know parents teach their children or teachers when they teach their child or a child they assume a certain position which comes close to the child and they have to be faithful to that but they are always free inside if the child wants to learn more grow more he'll be carried then he will discover what wonder lies in the heart of the teacher but if the child doesn't want to learn doesn't want to grow there is a freedom only for this much so this is an unfettered norm only the one or at that level one can assume there is a norm and yet one is not bound by it free and the free progress system that is the initiate yes it is that because the divine this is how the divine operates with the world you want to be with the divine in one way the divine will accept that approach you want to simply trust like a child that he will do everything for you he will do everything for you you want to walk the path to the union with the divine he will take you for the union with the divine you want to turn your back away and say i don't care about divine will say very fine thus shall you experience life that the divine doesn't care for you so we turn each of these experiences into a norm but actually he is free always and he has assumed this poise because it is necessary for the growth of our soul so at that level there is really no fetters and yet there is a seemingness of a certain norm is that that's why it's so difficult to understand the mother's ways champak lal ji once says that uh, earlier much earlier when people would bring artificial flowers oh yes i remember the this. mother yes. seemed that she did not like it so she would you know from a gestures or from it appeared that she was not uh, really appreciative of it and so everyone said mother doesn't mother like doesn't plastic like flowers mother doesn't like plastic flowers yes. then much later champak lal ji says that i saw when uh, well creativity had developed and people you know the flowers they had become, become beautiful much more beautiful, much more yes. beautiful. and then she would be very happy on receiving yeah. them so champak lal ji says that supposing at that moment somebody who saw this had gone away yeah. then he would come and say that well mother did not like artificial flowers yeah. you know there is a very interesting story going on the story of shiva so there is somebody who has seen shiva in his trance state when he is unmarried when he is without his shakti and this bhakta loves this shiva so much that he goes into his own deep meditation and thousands of year roll by an age rolls by and then he comes out with this om namo shivaya but time has moved shiva is married not once but twice not just sati but parvati he has two children and when he comes out he doesn't believe it is shiva he says you are an imposter and it is shiva because <laughs> he can cannot understand that how the shiva shiva can be both yeah. these together nothing binds he is free infinite but we have an angle of vision and we limit to that so this yes. one oxymoron reveals so much unfettered norm and mother says 
Do not take my words for yeah. teaching. Yes, exactly. They are always a force in action. Yes. Some even she has gone on to say even when it, my words get printed, I have seen that the power gets reduced. She said that, and someone asked mother, "What is it? What is there in what you speak that it, you know, does so much in us?" She the question is about running into five six lines. The mother's one word reply is consciousness. So, eventually. All these words are meant to enter into the state of consciousness embodied by the writer. That is their purpose. But we get lost into you know externalities and scholarly debates. Look at just this one line to meditate upon, and the stupendous gates of the alone. It's worth meditating across the unfolding of the seas of self. So the manifestation. Unfolding of the seas of self creation. Appeared the deathless countries of the one. A many miracle consciousness unrolled, vast aim and process and unfettered norms, a larger nature's great familiar roads. Now that is appearing for to Ashupati, a franchise from the net of earthly sense. So this is where. This is our prison. There is no other prison. And when Sri Aurobindo wrote that famous aphorism, that I went to a place full of holy men and I got bored. Yes. God took me to a prison, and I found him. Yeah. Then mother comments on this that he yeah. describes this about his experience in the yes, Alipur yes, jail. Yes, yes. That how even in prison, he was experiencing the one everywhere. So people who complain of outer circumstances and situations, all right, there is a uh, very momentary truth in that. But eventually, we have to become free from everything, and should be able to experience that sense of the one everywhere, enfranchised from the net of earthly sense. So, but for that, we have to become free from this grip that all the time senses and earthly sense. And it's a net. Net. Absolutely net. Because we see, we hear, we are taught what you see is true, what you hear is true. Yes. So, <laughs> not realizing that what we see and hear cannot be true by its very nature, because the senses are limited and false. They don't transmit truth. To start with, yes. it may have its temporary utility, and science has discovered it. You know, Earth is flat. No, it is round. My daily senses experiences, sun comes out of the east, but no, sun is static. Earth moves. <laughs> in fact, Shubhendra would say, sun and the earth both are drifting in endless space. So senses are very deceptive. And then what appears before us? Calm continents of potency were glimpsed. Again, we see the combination of opposites. This is a characteristic yes. of supermind. Calm continents of potency, potency, powerful calm, not a meaningless calm, not the calm of Shiva, the dead, but the calm of Shiva, the Almighty. So the calm continents of potency were glimpsed, homelands of beauty shut to human eyes. We cannot see, we cannot experience. Half seen at first through wonders, gleaming lids, surprise the vision with felicity. Suddenly, every sense is filled with delight, because the experience of the one begins to dawn. Sun bells of knowledge, moon bells of delight. So we know the sun and the moon are very uh, well-known symbols and visions in spiritual life and. The moon often uh, is the deity of soma, the delight. So it it he represents that aspect which is delight, and sun represents the blazing knowledge. So there are bells, not yet the sun and the moon, but the bells through which one passes and knowledge pours in spontaneously, automatically. Yes, sun belts, bells, moon belts, of knowledge, and moon bells of delight. Mere entering that uh, that state. That layer, that level of consciousness, one is filled with delight. St 
stressed out in an ecstasy of widenesses. So you see how visual it is. And that whole path is becoming wider and wider and wider. Beyond our indigent corporeal range. There he could enter. There a while abide. This, of course, the intuitive and the overmind plane, the borders of the supermind, which are belts where he has entered and he can stay, not only enter there, he could station himself there, a voyager upon uncharted roads. Beyond it, you cannot fix a path, adventure of the infinite, infinite adventure, as you said, fronting the viewless danger of the unknown. Marvelous line, the viewless danger, that which saves is also that which slays. Yes. It's fronting it. Yes. Shubindo says at one place in Savitri, he bore the stroke of that which saves and, and slays, yes. or slays and saves. Yes. Danger. Yeah. Because that is its power, that is its potency. Adventuring across enormous realms, he broke into another space and time. Now he is free, one with the infinite. Now he begins the exploration. So here ends Canto 5 of Book 1. The Yoga of the Spirit's Spirit Freedom and, and Greatness. greatness. We have a few minutes left, yes, we can. so why don't we go back and just you know, a brief overview of the first five cantos yes. of Book One, just to give yes. that rounded feeling. Yes. So as we see the first and second canto lay the base of the epic. So the first canto is about what this epic is about. It's the Birth of light in a world of darkness. Birth of delight in a world of suffering and pain. Birth of consciousness in a world driven by unconsciousness. And it starts with the dawn. Dawn is the one which brings this birth into being out of the unmanifest night. So it starts with that. And this is relevant to our own life because our own life journey is that. We do progress from darkness to light, from death to immortality. So the epic becomes contextual and contemporary and would remain contextual and contemporary for the future times until there is a complete supramental transformation. That is why it is the book of transformation. And Sri Aurobindo kept it in the epic form. Absolutely. So there is a whole... This epic is about the human journey, about individual journey, as well as the collective journey, because these new dawns break upon the race also. And just before that, the night is darkest. So it starts with the abysmal night, fathomless zero, the huge foreboding mind of night. We see, and every time a new dawn has to come, night suddenly takes hold of the consciousness of the race. Uh, it's uh, Shobindo speaks of this in one of his writings of the several sub cycles of the four yugas in each cycle. So every satyug has its satyug, treta, dwapar, and kalyug, yes. and every kalyug will have its high uplifting yes. moments and low. Yesterday night we had one of the we, dark we moments, had one of the dark, uh, dark moments, Paris bombing with one hundred and fifty dead and so many more injured. Yes, but. We, if we wait, this will be one more precursor for realigning the world in, the, in terms of truth. What happened after 9-11? There was a realignment of forces. Yes. What happened after Second World War? There was a realignment of forces. So after every night, there is the old harmony, the old order gets broken. And a new order and a new harmony begins to emerge. So this thick of night... And the emergence of light is the story of creation itself. And beautifully he starts by saying, creation itself is a divine event. Yes. But before every divine event, there is a huge fathomless mind of night 
and slowly 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 the darkness goes away and the light grows grows greater in the east as he says in savitri and the one who does it is the divine mother who whose feet touch the earth she comes and changes by her touch so this is the story and shurbindo in a nutshell in book 1 canto 1 uh, says so beautifully almost that day the epiphany was disclosed yes so all the truth that is going to happen actually every day it is disclosed to our eyes whoever doubts yes, that yes. any darkness will not have an end every day we experience it ends nature comes and tells us and our thoughts and yeah. hopes are the signal flares <laughs> signal Beautiful. flares good morning wake up yep. here is another day darkness yeah. is slain yes. so it's you know we have to look at that so this story in the very beginning first canto itself the whole symbol this dawn that comes in life of every human being every nation and every collective grouping of mankind and is destined to come is bound to come because it depends not on man not on earth but on the light that comes from the beyond morning does not wait for our prayers it comes regardless of it the only thing is man may choose to continue sleeping or wake up his eyes and collaborate this is all that is given <laughs> morning will come is the sun who will bring the morning so all that we find in book 1 canto 1 and why it has to go back it has to go back because again man is not ready so once again it re- retreat that also is described hard is it to persuade earth nature's change yeah, mortality, mortality bears, bears ill, ill the eternal touch. touch yes so all that is whole savitri in a summary way is given and then who is the dawn who is the symbol the bringer of dawn in this epic and savitri to evoke among the tribes so she comes she is the one who brings the dawn and she is the symbol of hope of love of light of bliss so this is how in book 1 canto 1 he lays the broad foundation tells the whole story and introduces us to the main uh, main character you know words fail yeah, <laughs> how do you describe savitri <laughs> savitri savitri <laughs> to call of her a personality a person a woman an avatar all these are belittling <laughs> yes. savitri is savitri the bringer of light then he goes one step further and issue issue yes what is the problem that she has come to resolve what is our real issue there are people who will make us believe that our issue is you know food and a roof house and clothes this is not the issue for this issue the divine doesn't have to come down he can do it through many many persons on earth many vibhutis the real issue is the imperfection of earthly life because matter itself doesn't respond to the divine this is the issue and therefore even when the great ones come into this jail so beautifully a jail is this immense material world yeah, yeah. at every yeah. step there is a Long, law yes harsh stone law stone eyed law stone eyed law harsh economy of nature yes so much struggle so much pain suffering for one step why is it so see we don't raise this question shubindo raises it for us why shouldn't spiritual life be the most natural thing for us why we have to struggle and meditate and practice yoga and all this sacrifice of all we cherish here to get one moment of glimpse of the divine when divine is the one and only reality there is nothing else but that now here he says why it is so yes it is because matter and of course the triple worlds they are the veils and unless they change life will be like that the soul just to extricate itself has to do tremendous effort because it's caught in a net of ignorance the soul itself is wonderful always turn to the divine as mother said when someone says he is a wicked soul mother said you have given up yourself by saying he is a wicked soul all souls are beautiful yes all souls are turned towards the divine yes. and she says it means you don't know your own soul that time you know uh, in one of our conversation what do you mean by saying wicked soul yeah. souls are always beautiful they always turn to the divine but nature the clouding the layers the ma- matter in which it is the shroud of ignorance that is death yes 
So the first thing is to get out of this ignorance. And Ashwapati shows the way. The first step of the yoga is to come out of this ignorance. So we have book 1, canto 3, the yoga of the king, the soul's release from ignorance. Of course, there is a way to connect book 1, canto 2 to uh, book 8, death in the forest, canto yes, 3. Yes, but we yes. don't have to do that. This is the first step. Unless we are freed from ignorance and freedom from ignorance, so beautifully Sri describes the effects that take place. Freedom from ignorance is that we do not make the mistake of identifying ourselves with the mind, life and body. We know we are a soul. Beautifully as Swami Ramtirth in one of his talks, someone said, so, no, Swami Vivekananda. So, you mean to say that you have a soul? We all have a soul? He says, no, I don't mean to say that. I am saying that I am a soul and I have a body. Yeah. The Upanishads say, he spat out the body. Death is des described as spitting out the body. Not the soul leaving, spitting out. And Vivekananda came to somebody's dream actually in one of the, you know, the night he passed away. And he literally said, I have spat out the body. It's directly from the Upanishads. So this is freedom from ignorance. We know, don't make that mistake. And as we are freed from that, a new vision, Mother uses the word reversal of consciousness, a wide God knowledge widened from within, world knowledge widened from within. And then a deeper God knowledge poured from above. The mode of knowing changes. It's no more the galley slave labor of the analytical mind. <laughs> you know, this piecing of information by the scholarly mind can reveal nothing, even about water, earthly life, leave aside the divine. But that's the mode we know. But when this skull is blown, <laughs> literally the lid is blown, <laughs> a wide God knowledge pours from above, a deep world knowledge widens from within. So that is the freedom from ignorance. Yes. And many yogis are satisfied with that and they would like to, you know, uh, take recourse but Ashwapati discovered something else. He discovered that beyond this realm of ignorance, these first gleamings of knowledge from above and from within, these reversals, are only precursors to many things that are yet unseen, many glories. It's like when we see the sun from afar, it's one shining ball of fire. But if we go near and near, we will see many layers of light. And that burning fire, that's how people describe. Even from afar, we talk about the corona and the penumbra and yes, the yes. main center. So that's how it is. But from here, it looks that one glory. So Ashupati takes it because he is born with this work and this mission to explore what lies beyond freedom from ignorance is fine. That gives us nirvana. We are free from, we need not come for rebirth again because the schooling is over. We have been given a certificate. <laughs> Past graduation, <laughs> you, if you want, you can go away. But the masters come back to the school to teach or some who have a special work to do in the world, vibhutis. And of course, the divine himself descends as avatar. Great lines can join after the soul is freed. All that is described now in the secret knowledge. What are these possibilities? What he discovered? What, what is possible to discover? Ashwapati has discovered that there is the secret one and this whole creation is his play. The two who are the one are the might and right in everything. All here that seems to be its lonely self are figures of the soul transcendent one. How beautiful. Our light and darkness are their souls Interchange. interchange. Their eyes interchange. Their eyes Our interchange. knowledge and ignorance are oh, their, their eyes, eyes interchange. interchange. What we call as knowledge, what we call as ignorance, ah. is both a play of the divine. Yes. We see these verses, some of them in the Ish Upanishad, about that, that kind of a self. And what are the signs of this self-knowledge, this, this secret into which we enter. So all this is beautifully described in the secret knowledge. Above all, the goal of the journeyings of the mystery years. Where do we go? Where is this caravan going? Is it just a meaningless journey ending in a blank port of nirvana? Ah, or to discover yes. 
a new mind and body in the city of God. And that section that begins with this is the same world, on the world, flow of time yes, the world is the greatest for me yes. unbroken Absolutely. vision. This is the sailor, world sailor on the flow oh. of time. So, you know, in th this secret knowledge is the base. This is the Vedanta of Sri Aurobindo. And this Vedanta comes several places in secret knowledge. Yes. This is a different Vedanta from what we have heard or accustomed to. Yes. Look at these lines. One who has shaped this world is ever its Lord. Yes. Our errors are his steps upon the way. He works through the fierce vicissitudes of our lives. He works through the hard breath of battle and toil. He works through our sins, our sorrows and our tears. This his, is Vedanta. His knowledge overrules our, our nations. Oh. Whatever the appearance, we must bear. Yes. When nothing we can do but drift and bail, a mighty guidance leads us still through all. Through. This is Vedanta of Vedanta. Not that there is that and this is yes. Maya illusion. Yes. There is nothing else but that. And then this aspect of Vedanta, which brings in, reconciles the avatarhood. See, in, in traditional Vedanta, they can't believe in avatarhood because how can the infinite limit himself? But look at Shubhindu's lines. Alive in a dead rotating Universe, we whirl not here upon a casual globe. A divine intervention thrones above. Yes. It enters. It again and again comes. And eventually it is the one who will conquer yes. the resisting world. And beauty conquer the resisting world. When darkness deepens, thus shall the mount, uh, thus shall the uh, mass transcendent mount his throne. his throne. When darkness deepens, strangling the earth's Breast and man's corporeal mind is the only lamp as a thief's in the night, night shall be the covert. So this whole secret knowledge, this is the base. If somebody wants to know, what are Sri views on Vedanta? No. Rather we should say what Sri reveals is Vedanta. The most perfect Vedanta. And that is in secret knowledge. It literally means Vedanta. You know, the knowledge which cannot come by senses and mind is the secret knowledge. And Ashwapati can have access to it because he is freed from ignorance. So he can arrive at this knowledge. Having arrived at this knowledge, fundamental knowledge, now he explores the kingdoms, glories, he glimpses them. And he discovers, oh, there is so much waiting in the unmanifest. We just read. Waiting to be born. Waiting for its hour. The many miracle consciousness. Such glory, such sun belts of knowledge, moon belts of delight, waiting to pour upon earth. And then, of course, he makes the last great sacrifice. Or the first. I mean, Sri Aurobindo's whole life can be seen as a series of renunciation, external and internal. He renounces his coveted ICS. In fact, starts before that renounces the comfort of his home to live in the UK under harsh conditions. Yes. Any lesser soul would have said, I can't stay because they had really tough time. A penny or two a day. And he describes all that was available was a cup of tea and sausage or something which they had to have. And Shubhindu doesn't speak even once bitterly about his father. Manmohan speaks. In his letters. But Sri Aurobindo never. What a, and during that time he talks about light, that poem written at 11 and yes. harmony of virtue at 18. Amazing. Then he renounces the coveted ICS. After all this education, yes. he renounces because he must know India, the Indian people, joins the state of Baroda. And then he renounces, renounces. a luxurious job where he was getting up to 750 rupees a month during that time. Yes. And the secretary to Maharaja Baroda, it means something. Imagine a high secretary in the government of India. They go crazy in the prime minister's office. And he is at that point of time to the Maharaja. And he renounces for the sake of the freedom struggle. Which and he then renounces. Which he then again renounces after having prepared all the lines. 
he renounces for a greater work. He renounces all the experiences he had before coming to Pondicherry. He says in a letter to Barin, all that were preparations. Who can say that seeing Vasudevam Sarvamiti and the stillness of Nirvana is a preparation? And then he renounces all that to lodge himself in a cave of tapasya yeah. called Pondicherry. And then he renounces the supramental realization in his own body for the sake of hastening the collective work. And that we see in book two, it starts. He stands on the doors and he plunges himself back to matter. Of course, he is armed now with the deathless light yes. because he has conquered it. He is armed with the fiat of the infinite. With that he discovers, explores. That, of course, is revealed. And then he renounces everything. All that he has achieved, struggled, rightfully acquired for the sake of hastening the collective descent and God's mm -hmm. martyred body. Lo, it is finished, the dread mysterious sacrifice of God's martyred body in the world. And all that he has received, achieved, passes on into the mother's body. Where else can we find an example of renunciation? I mean, really tears come to eyes. People talk of renunciation, walking away from home, leaving your clothes and living in Himalayas. It's a very comfortable life, much better than living in Delhi and Bombay. And what with devotees who will make sure that you have dry fruits. And after a while, your body gets used to it. But this is renunciation of renunciation. Someone should write, Sri Aurobindo the Great Renunciate. This is his Shiva aspect. Even as he has the Krishna aspect. Taking the collective march of mankind, whether it be the freedom struggle of India or the great world war, everywhere he has taken or in the ashram where we have a representative collectivity, carries everyone together. So this is the base in the first book of Sri own yoga, his own experiences. And after this he will launch into a journey as he has said, a different kind of a journey. No more for himself, but to prepare earth for which he must first see this entire creation, but from another light, another consciousness, and then break further beyond into the supramental and bring down the grace of the Divine Mother in Book 3. Then his yoga at one level is over and the Mother is in the forefront and he steps behind.